on today's episode of Inside the NFL. It's a collaboration y'all have been asking for. As I sit down with Alf Artiaga from Three Yards Per Carry, we're going to discuss Tyreek Hill. Is this his last year as a Miami Dolphin, or does it make more sense for the Dolphins if they are going to move off of him after 2025 or should they extend him we will talk about that also we will talk about Tua's contract we will talk about what the framework should look like and what quarterback who recently signed the Miami Dolphins should be taking notes from when they put Tua's contract together we will also talk about the draft class big fans of Jalen Wright so we'll talk about him a lot of stuff to talk about in this episode. Do me the favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you are new. Let's get into this. You have got to be kidding me. Jalen Waddle has a dolphin touchdown. What's good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy, Reason. And we are back here for another one. And one of the most requested guests for me to bring on Finn's side, the NFL. I snagged him. Alf Artiaga from Three Yards Per Carry is here. And we're going to talk Dolphins. And we're going to dive into it as we're fresh off the draft, mini camp, and everything like that. So, Alf, first and foremost, how you doing, brother? How are you feeling uh, coming off of that draft class with X's money about to clear up and Miami potentially getting back into play in the free agent market. How are you feeling right now as a, as you know, as someone who covers this team? Oh, I'm feeling pretty good about the team. I'm feeling pretty good about where they are right now. Roster wise. It's just a couple of holes, you know, that you got to fill. If you, if you play the, the depth chart game, you are just looking at what they, what they have and what they could possibly need. I guess you could, they can use an interior offensive lineman and a safety. And then I think it's pretty much a wrap. Then you're talking about training camp filler, but the roster is good. And, you know, I do project them to win the division and that is the expectation. Okay. The roster is good. And I would agree with you. One of the conversations that's been happening over X, the couple last couple weeks and a couple beat reporters have written articles about, I want to get your thoughts on where do you compare this roster in terms of last year's do you see this roster as better if they add you know a safety in an interior offensive lineman do you see it as on the same level do you see this roster taking a step back obviously you don't see them taking a step back to win the division where do you see this roster comparatively to last year's roster i think it's it's a little bit better it's deeper Mm. Uh, there's a little bit of redundancy built in now and i understand that bradley chubb and jalen phillips are coming off major injuries but I do expect Jalen Phillips back this season. And I do yeah. expect Bradley Chubb to play as well this year. So, you know, modern medicine is what it is nowadays. So, you know, I don't really expect them to have major setbacks. I don't expect them to be at 60, 70%. I do expect them to be reasonably close to their 100%. So if you believe that, they're much more deeper on the edge. They, you can't replace a Christian Wilkins. He's a $120 million defensive tackle. You don't yep. replace those guys. So what you do is you try to recreate them somehow in the aggregate mm-hmm. with, you know, zero text, three text, five text, and you try to play around that. And I've tried to explain to people all the time, we you were spoiled as Dolphin fans for having a Kristen Wilkins and a Zach Seeler. Most teams only have one of those. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're like everybody else. You have one of those. Zach Seeler, I really do believe, is a top 10-ish kind of defensive tackle. I agree. I think they 
upgraded at linebacker. I was a huge Jerome Baker fan, and I think he's he's a pretty good player. Jordan Brooks is just better. Mm-hmm. You know, he just is. Anthony Walker gives you some added depth. Last year, you were thinking about Duke Riley as LB3 coming off the bench to play Scrape and Phil. Mm-hmm. Now he's LB4. That's a good thing. Yep. And Xavier Howard, I do believe, belongs in the Ring of Honor. But let's face it, it's two years in a row where when you've needed him, he's been injured. And that was going to continue to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, Kendall Fuller, I believe, is an upgrade over him. Yep. Jordan Poyer is an upgrade over Deshaun Elliott. You added Jalen Wright to your running back room. Devon Achan is a year older. Jonu Smith is the best pass catcher we've had here since, I don't remember, maybe Cameron, uh, like five, six years ago. Mm-hmm. Odell Beckham is now wide receiver three. You drafted Malik Washington, Taj Washington. I could go on and on. The yeah. only place where they, they've, I think, taken... A slight step back, I do believe that Robert Hunt is one of the best guards in football. I don't replace a guy like that. You're going to have to scheme around that. So if you if you must be a little bit pessimistic, I guess be pessimistic about the offensive line. But everywhere else, I believe that they've upgraded. Are you settling in and are you have you come to terms like I have that we're probably going to see a Jack Driscoll um, and Liam Eikenberg battle for Robert Hunt's spot, or do you legitimately think they will add another guy to compete at right guard? You got to think that they're going to add somebody else. Look, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, right before the 2022 season, yeah, they placed a call to Graham Glasgow, and Glasgow took, I believe, $2 million to go to Detroit. Yeah, He just signed for three years, $21 million, I believe. So, so he made the right decision. He went and yeah. played one season in Detroit on a really good offensive line, turned down the Dolphins. Uh, so I'm guessing the Dolphins weren't promising him a starter spot because at that time, the only thing that was open was left guard. Mm-hmm. And Glasgow has some versatility, some position versatility where he could play center and guard. And who knows if maybe that's something that he wanted to do here and we weren't going to let him do it. Signs with Detroit and has a very good season and then signs a pretty good contract. I think Greg Van Roten is Graham Glasgow in 2024. Yep. So if you could add somebody like Greg Van Roten, okay, now you're adding a little bit of redundancy into the whole group. Liam Eikenberg has some position versatility. He can play left, right, and center. Um, I kind of like the UDFA, Matthew Jones. Uh, he can play center as well. And his tape, uh, you watch his tape, and I guess you know his athletic profile is not one where it's going to get you drafted, but you know, Robert Jones didn't get drafted either. And Matthew Jones kind of strikes me as the new age Robert Jones. I think that he's going to make his name known in camp. So if you could go get a Greg Van Roten, man, you got three deep at guard at left and right. And you're essentially three deep at center with Brewer, Eichenberg, and possibly Matthew Jones. I'm good with it. That makes you very, very deep. And that's a lot of competition to find five starters you can trust. Yeah, I got to, you know, speaking of Matthew Jones, I liked his, from what I saw, from what I watched of him compared to what I watched of like, say, Andrew Meyer from UTEP. Mm. I think Matthew Jones definitely has a better chance, you know, considering the the depth right now on that interior of making this team. You know, you spoke about a few of the UDFAs. Who are some of the guys you like in that UDFA class? Now we know, you know, you know, Quer is Nato uh, uh, Durval or Duval, whatever his last name was, ha- has me with a little pause on Baron Matos, even though, man, the traits are absolutely ridiculous for that kid. Leonard Payne was an interesting guy coming out of Colorado State. Um, but where, what's really interesting to me is the safeties. Like, I actually thought Mark Perry's film at TCU was decent. You know, the, Isaiah Johnson, they're probably going to convert him from corner to safety from Syracuse. Mm-hmm. What, were, what are your thoughts of the UDFA class? Like a guy who I really think has a good shot of making this team, given the injuries you spoke about earlier to Phillips and Chubb, I liked Grayson Murphy's film. I was a fan of his brother. His brother made my top 15 big board, Gabriel Murphy. You know, I watched a lot of them because I, I was a big Leatu Latu fan. What, what are your thoughts of the UDFA class? Do you see a couple guys who might sneak in to even, you know, make it a hard decision to cut them off of the 53 if they don't make the 53? Yeah, I was talking about this on, on OnlyFans, and I actually wrote down the four that I have 
probably making the 53. Okay. And that's Perry, Jones, Storm Duck, and Grayson Murphy. I like all three defensive backs, Isaiah Johnson, Storm Duck, and Mark Perry. Uh, I think Storm Duck will play corner, okay? Yeah. Uh, he's really good facing the quarterback. He's really good in cover three. They're going to want to play a lot of cover three. So he has a shot at the at the roster at the least, but I think he's going to make the practice squad. Mm-hmm. You know, I like I, I like Burton. You know, Burton's a burner. He's gonna he's gonna show out in camp because those guys those guys that are really good athletically are always going to look good. Okay, mm-hmm. but Isaiah Johnson is interesting. If they don't add a safety, maybe they think they already have him in house, right? Need him. You know, need, Nick Needham is going to be probably a safety this year. Uh, but they do need that position versatility because you know they are they do want to play three safeties, they want to play a lot of cover three. They're they're gonna have very few cover two elements in this defense. You know, I, I'm just taking Anthony Weaver by the way at his word. He says that yeah, he's yeah. gonna run a defense similar to what Mike McDonald ran. So if you're gonna do that, you're probably short a safety that you can trust, especially if you're gonna play Ramsey the way it, he was promised. You're gonna play him in the star role. You're gonna play him in as the cover three safety, similar to how they played Kyle Hamilton Hamilton in, in Baltimore. You know, I don't think he'll play single high. I think that's Holland's job yeah. uh, almost exclusively. But, yeah, you know, if Needham is going to move over, I still think you're short a body. But I like those three guys. I'm interested in seeing them. You know, mm. uh, there was a time where we didn't know who Elijah Campbell is, and now he's going to be counted on to play some snaps. So, yeah, Mark Perry, Isaiah Johnson, Storm Duck. Storm Duck has a corner. I think mm-hmm. Isaiah Johnson, Mark Perry have a shot at the 53. So let's stick with the draft for a second here. <clears throat> what did you think of this draft class? Um, you know, I know you guys, you know, you guys over there, like me, were fans of Chop. Um, I know you guys, we shared a lot of the same outlook on a lot of these picks you know i had patrick paul as my ot12 i had kingsley sua matea um roger rosengarden and kieran amagaji i had them rated higher than patrick paul when they took patrick paul i know you were not you could throw in blake fisher as well blake fisher you had him hot rated. i know you guys were not big fans of patrick paul (laughs) yeah um of the pick (laughs) um we called our shot there man you got to give us credit what, what okay. did you think of the picks, the first two picks? Okay, look, Chop Robinson, and I've tried to explain this to people because, you know, because you get labeled like, oh, you know, you hate the draft pick or whatever. I just don't like taking in the first round a guy that I have rated fourth out of a group, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to get a guy who's a little bit better at, on my board at a position group, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that he's not a first round pick. He's absolutely worth a first round pick. It was a pretty good edge class. Yeah. You know, but I had four guys rated and I had them fourth. I had Latu mm-hmm. first, I had Verse second, I had Turner third, and I had Chop Robinson fourth. Doesn't mean I don't like him. It just means that he's fourth on my list. Mm-hmm. Uh his his first burst, his first step is is something Ridiculous. else. And, and he's an athletic wonder. Yeah. You know, and he's a smart kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's gonna do good things here. He doesn't have the pressure that he would have had he's let's say, I don't know gone to somebody like like Jacksonville and he has to play opposite of, of Josh Allen or I don't know gone to Tampa Bay and been handed the spot like Jared versus being handed his spot yeah you know so he could be he could come along a little bit slower and that's fine uh so contrary to popular belief uh CK absolutely loves chop Robinson he had him number two and the only reason he had him number two was because of Liatu Latu's production which was absolutely insane yeah so he had him number two, so he's ecstatic with the pick. Uh, we called our shot with Patrick Paul, man. As soon as we heard about it, we talked about it on a podcast. When we did our offensive line uh, evaluations, when we were talking about offensive tackles, we were talking about who do you absolutely n- do not want at pick 55 because we kind of we kind of had it pegged that if they couldn't get Fatano at 21, that offensive tackle was probably going to be pushed back to 55. And we mm. said, who's in play and who do you not want? And we debated Blake Fisher. We played at Rosengarden. We played at Kingsley. So with the t- I have a problem with his last name. <laughs> but we all said the same thing. Man, Patrick Paul is incomplete. That guy needs to get in the lab. He's eye candy. 
You know, he's all that good body nonsense that yeah. I, I absolutely despise about NFL scouting. But it's the truth. And I've been told from people inside the building, man. He walks into the building. He goes into the weight room. You just start looking like, wow. Like, that's what an NFL offensive tackle looks like, you know? I've seen that before. Brian McKinney. Have you ever have you ever met yeah, Brian McKinney I, in person? No, I haven't met him, but I remember Brian McKinney 100%. Okay, he played here only one year. Uh, yeah, was at the end I of remember. his career. Yeah. But you you see him in person, you're like, Jesus Christ, this is a human being, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you could do things where, like, like um, we were in the studio. I was an executive producer of Sports Bank. It was a TV show down here. And uh, they were telling me, do that, make a fist in front of Bryant McKinney so you could see what he could do. So I'd make a fist in front of Bryant McKinney, and he would get his hand, and he'd just go like this, and he would cover my entire fist up to my, my wrists. Holy jeez. Now, I don't have small hands, by the way. I have <laughs> nine and an eighth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't have small hands. Uh, that is who Patrick Paul is. Like he walks into the building, he walks into the weight room, and you're gonna look at him, and you're gonna say, "Wow!" Like this is precisely what you want at offensive tackle. Problem is the tape is incomplete and it's weak. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody likes to talk about his pass pro problems, and that's fine. It's been well documented. My problems with him are in 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 the run game. He drops his head. He misses his aim points. Doesn't get on the right shoulder. Sometimes he gets grabby. And man, <laughs> sometimes. And, oh my God. In the NFL, in the NFL, that is a massive red flag. Referees are itching to throw flags on run plays when they see yeah. your hands leave the frame yeah. uh, of your defender. So that's a problem. Good news is they're not counting on him on him to play a lot of snaps this year. That's Kendall Lamb's job. But man. Let me ask you. We this. know we can't. We know we can't count on Tehran to play a lot. Yeah. Well. So, okay. So, so let me ask it, you this. Okay. Because mm-hmm. Butch Berry, everyone you know has a good. Ha, everyone has a good feeling about Butch Berry because everyone you know says, "Hey, you worked a minor miracle. You got Austin Jackson paid, and Liam Eikenberg looks serviceable. Bravo." Mm-hmm. Does it worry you that Patrick Paul is already twenty four, has had like, you know, multi multi thousand snaps at that level? And does it worry you that there might not be much room for growth in terms of like, he's going to be 25, you know, habits start settling in when you get into your mid twenties like that. And it's really hard to get habits out of players. It's not like when they're 21. Right. So what were your thoughts on that? Like, do you think this is a, like, might be too big of a project because I've heard you talk about, and I've had Dante Colonelli on the show, and he said the same thing you said. They got to tear down and rebuild, basically. Do you think because of how far he is into his development and already being almost, you know, at 24, going to be 25 next year, is this one of those things where it's going to be very, very hard for Butch Berry to break a lot of these habits? Because, Alf, when I watched the film, Holy boy, the arm coming across and grabbing the opposite shoulder. I, I counted like, man, you watch like six, seven games of this guy, and you'll count like a half a dozen to a dozen flags that weren't thrown. Yeah. Look, look, when, when you run block, especially in our system, but almost in any system, when you're blocking one, one gap over, you want to keep your head up. You want to get your hands inside your frame. You want to mm-hmm. strike. You want to extend. He hugs. Yeah. yeah. When you hug, they see your hands. When they see your hands, the flags come out. When the flags come out, you can't play. You got you got to go to the bench. Okay, yeah. so uh, am I concerned? Absolutely. Uh, it's I think I believe it's three thousand snaps in college. Yeah, and it's crazy. Yeah, that, that's a lot, man. So, am I concerned? Yes. Now, here's the good news. You know, this is the pros. They have the be- very best facilities. You have a really good coach that understands all O line play. Butch Barry is good at what he does. Austin Jackson was a little bit different. Austin Jackson had horrible technique issues as well. Yeah. But they said, you know what? Work on your body, get a little leaner, and maybe this is going to allow you to get to your, your aim points a little bit better. And lo and behold, bang, he worked on his body, got in better shape, got leaner, got faster, and now he's hitting all his aim points. And that's why I think he's one of the better run blocking tackles in football. But Patrick Paul, man, it's gonna have to take it's gonna have to take a complete overhaul, and really on technique. It's a you know they're gonna have to have to have them work under that hood that they have in Michigan. I posted about this on on, on Twitter, I believe, about the the drills that they have at Michigan to try to get keep guys low, keep their head yeah. up. So 
you know, yeah, they're, they're going to have to. It's it's a complete teardown, a complete rebuild. The good news is he's going to go against pretty damn good players. But that's not my concern. My concern is really in the run game. I think they'll get him right in pass pro. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think they'll get him right because those are two very, very simple things, your kick and your hand placement. I think they could work on that. They could get that right. But run blocking, I think it's an issue. And in this system, you need good run, run blocking tackles. You know, it's a hell of a step down from Teron Arms to the Patrick Paul if he's not right. Do you think in a big issue with him is the bend in the, in, in the hips? And, he, you know, you know, he plays a little upright. And because of his size already, that allows power defenders to get inside his chest and they can give him issues, right? Do you think? Yeah, he's a high cut guy. He's a high cut yeah. guy, which is uh, it's it's for laymen out there. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying he has long legs. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be hard. He has to bend his knees, man. He has to bend his knees. He has to power through. Stop dropping your head. You drop your head, you're going to miss your aim points. People are just going to run around you. Yeah. <laughs> All right? Yeah. They don't yeah. have to take you on. So as long as he keeps his head up, drop your hips, bend your knees, that should be good. He has an entire camp to work on it. He gets to be in the lab for an entire year. Most guys don't have that luxury. And he's with Duke Manyweather right now, eh? Of O-line yep. mastermind. So... Mm -hmm. At least he's surrounding himself with some of the best, you know. I mean, let's just hope they put it together. Yeah, the good um, news is that there's not six, seven, three hundred and thirty pound guys that could throw up two twenty five thirty times walking around true. Earth. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, you true. don't find those guys. Yeah, like that. it's true. What were your thoughts on day three? Um, Jalen Wright, they traded up and out of Jalen Wright. I had him as a top 70 player in this draft. He was on my man crush list. Him and Trey Benson were my two favorite running backs of this class. Um, what, what were your thoughts on the move up for Jalen Wright, what he brings to this running back room? Also adding Mo Kamara and Malik Washington. We'll get to McMorris and Tajay in a second here. But those three guys look like the prize selections of day three, and they all look like steals in their own right. What are your thoughts on those three guys? Well, nobody can ever accuse me or us, really, of being like shills for the team because we talked about all of this before the draft happened, and it was as if we were in that draft room. They actually beat me to it because uh, when we talked about our edge players, I said Miami needs to trade a third-round pick from 2025 to get into the fourth round to take Mo Camaro. They didn't even mm. need to do that. They mm. used a fifth-round pick on him, and they used that maneuver to take my RB1. Mm -hmm. So Jalen Wright, I believe, is a guy that will play. He's going to help keep Mostert's legs fresh, and we've seen already two years in a row he hasn't finished the season. Yep. So – you know, that gives you a little bit more redundancy, man. And that's more that you, that's something that you needed in this offense. I think mm -hmm. that he's a guy that, you know, not to be arrogant about it, but you play some of these weaker teams, you know, and you're up on them, you know, a couple of touchdowns. Most of it doesn't need to take a fourth, a fourth quarter carry. A Chan doesn't need to take a fourth quarter carry. You can have Jalen Wright and Chris Brooks out there handling the, the garbage time. Instead of having Mostert carry the ball up three or four touchdowns. Okay. So, man, I love that pick. And I and we talked about it. We were over the moon with that pick. Uh, we love the player uh, when we did our draft preview. Uh, I love Mo Kamara. Uh, I think he is this year's Andrew Van Ginkle. People that, that think that they lost something with Andrew Van Ginkle, just see what Mo Kamara gives you. He could be that guy. He could be that guy four years from now that we're struggling to pay. Yeah, All right? I agree. Yep. Uh, Malik Washington is, he is so mature. Uh, I encourage everybody to go see his interview with Steve Smith Jr. I mean, Steve Smith Sr. Uh, the guy is, is he's mature. He's a mature football player. If you watch him, there's nuance to what he does. He does not drop footballs. He breaks tackles. And he ain't, he ain't a little guy. Everybody keeps, oh, that's another, they got another pounds, munchkin. maybe. Yeah. 194 pounds, man, and it shows up on film. He breaks tackles. He drops his head. He breaks tackles. He reaches for the goal line. This guy's tough. Uh, I understand that he wants to play outside. It's going to be a little bit difficult for him on this team. I think he comes in as a slot specialist, and I do believe he puts Braxton Berrios in a bit of danger uh, right mm -hmm. off the bat. Uh, Taj Washington, man, great college football player. Yeah, Good measurables. Smart. Kind of, he's small. Uh, yes, can he play in the slot? He can also play outside. Uh, really good tape. 
I I have him. I think they all make the team, by the way. But I think he is likely to spend a year redshirted as a practice squad player. Patrick McMorris, I did no work on him. Either uh, <laughs> my partner, Simon Clancy, put him in his draft book, but he said he was unremarkable. Uh, that's a guy you had to dig a little bit deeper. He played in a couple of big programs. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, he does miss tackles. Yeah. Uh, he does some of this this grabby stuff, but he does shoot gaps, uh, which makes him probably a good box player. Good news is they have about seven guys for four spots. He could be one of the guys on the outside looking in. But you got to give your, your scouting staff a bone, and that's obvious that that's a guy that, you're scouting, that their scouting staff was – Pounding the table like, hey, use one of these six round picks on him because I think he'll he'll contribute. And they did. I just didn't do any work on him. I was recommended by uh, someone to go back and watch the San Diego State film because it's better than the Cal film, and they weren't lying. That's all I'll say about Patrick McMorris. You know, like I went back after someone recommended that, and I was like, oh yeah, it is better. But yeah. Um, now let's talk about safety for a second. We touched on it a little bit earlier that they need one. Now. Javon Holland, um, you know, he he's he doesn't have a fifth year option, you know. Um it's pretty well known he wants some he doesn't want he wants to be cl- come close to resetting that market if you don't reset the market at safety, okay? Yeah. Um his, his agency has done a fantastic job of keeping him in the conversation always with young top safeties in the national media, not just the local media. Given that, but then you look at the wide receiver market and how it's moving and how, how Mon Ross St. Brown's been paid, how A.J. Brown just got paid and their annual averages beat out Tyreek Hill. With Jamar Chase, that extension, that's the one that I think is going to impact Waddle than all the other ones. Who would be the higher priority for you? Getting Waddle's extension done before Chase's money hits or getting Holland done? Which one would be the higher priority for you? I think Holland, because I think that's going to be a little bit friendlier deal to pull off. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, okay. Safety market, you saw what's happened this year. Yeah. Quandry Diggs is out there. Justin Simmons. Yeah. Justin Simmons is probably the best the best single high safety in football. Uh, no offense to Jesse Bates. Mm-hmm. And he's out there just sitting there begging for a job. <laughs> All right? So, you know, people are not paying safeties. At least not they're not now. The last one that got paid was Jesse Bates. I think something like look what happened with Tyron Matthew when he went to to New Orleans. I believe he got like seven and a half million dollars, and everybody was thinking he was going to get somewhere around fifteen or sixteen. Mm-hmm. You know, look what's happened with Buda Baker. Uh, I think Javon Holland is a guy that you could reasonably you know negotiate with and get him into that top five ish range, and it's really not a big burden on your cap. Mm-hmm. Jalen Waddle's a little bit different story because we don't know what he thinks. And from my point of view, I think Devonta Smith's uh, contract made things easy because you tell him, look, here's this. You just move over to, you know, you just slide it over from, you know, across the table. Same deal that Devonta Smith got. And, you know, just sign on, Jalen. If he refuses that, I think you have a little bit of wiggle room up until you start getting into those numbers that, Jamar Chase is going to get, and then Amal Ross St. Brown got. Mm -hmm. So there's a gap there that you can play with to get Mm -hmm. Jalen Waddell, you know, under contract. I think the one that's really kind of in danger is is, uh, Jalen Phillips because that's not a guy that you're going to get out there, out in front of, you know, of everything else to try to get a deal done. Yeah. And he can pop off. Look, and people are thinking, oh, he's coming off on an Achilles. He's not going to have a monster year. Cameron Wake damn near had uh, a career year coming off of an Achilles injury, and he was 33 years old, I believe. Mm. So Jalen Phillips goes out there, and he pops off with 15 or 16 sacks. We got ourselves a Wilkins situation. (laughs) So let's uh, you're you're 110% right, because we've seen him be on the cusp of that, and injuries have stopped him, right? So let me ask you this. Chubbs out is in 2025, right? Mm. You've got high praise from O'Kamara. I've got high praise from O'Kamara. You see the ceiling being extremely high on Chop Robinson. I see the ceiling being high. So obviously the team sees it. This is what my point is. Are those guys putting Chubb? Is Chubb looking over his shoulder now? Is he on notice? In like, like you're giving them this year to develop, and then by year two, 
with what you see in year one, you could be saying to yourself, you know, Austin Clark and guys could be turning themselves and saying, well, these guys might make a jump in year two where you can move off of Chubb. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, if they're going to look for savings to pay other people, that's where that's the first place they're going to go look. Yeah. Especially since they're going to have an embarrassment of riches. If all these guys pan out, of course, yeah, at the position. You got to remember, uh, Shaq Barrett has, I believe, three void years. They could just fill one of those void years, and there's your, your fourth edge player for next year. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. So yeah. they built in some, some redundancy there. Who knows who, mm -hmm. what Grayson Murphy's going to be? Exactly. Who knows if Cameron Good develops a further uh, another year in the system? Yeah. So, yeah, I would say Bradley Chubb is the most likely one where they're going to seek savings on for 2025. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's key. But it's also important that that Jalen Phillips comes back from his injury and he looks like Jalen Phillips. And I do I have a lot of faith in that. You know, it's I'm talking about a 20, 24 year old. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and this is not a guy that's out there eating cheeseburgers and and fries. Okay, this is a guy that really is dedicated to his craft and his body, so he's gonna get right for the season. Mm -hmm. And but I do put him third. He's third in that pecking order, and he's yeah. the one that's most in danger because what are you gonna do? He pops off with those sixteen sacks. You know, you're gonna give him thirty million dollars a year. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um. Okay, so. I just want to ask you kind of shift here and then we'll get back to dolphins. We we're talking about Achilles injuries and ages and stuff. You remember Marino's Achilles injury, right? Yeah. And you remember the effect it had on him as a player, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where do you like, am I the only one? I don't know. Do you share the sentiment that I'm sitting here laughing and everyone thinking the jets are going to be this amazing team this year because what Aaron Rodgers was eight or nine years older than what now I get medicines in a different place. But he's eight or nine years older than Marino was when Marino had that injury. Are you buying into this Jets hype? No, no. And I, and I'll tell you why. Look, Marino, when he had his injury, he came back nineteen ninety four. Uh, he was really good in that first game against the the Patriots. Threw for over four hundred yards. Uh, I believe it was five touchdowns in that game, uh, and he had a good season. But you could see what you know what that injury took a toll on him, okay? Because he started a slow decline toward 1999 when he was essentially just done and he started having shoulder problems. Uh, the problem that Aaron Rodgers has is I don't think they really fixed that offensive line. I like John Simpson, uh, mm -hmm. who is their new left guard. Think about what they're counting on. They're counting on Tyron Smith, who's – more often injured than than Teron Armstead. Yep. Morgan Moses, who's put together with scotch tape, and Eliza Vera Tucker, who's coming off of an Achilles injury. And we don't know who the hell the center is. Mm. That's the downfall of Aaron Rodgers because he's a guy who likes to scan. He yeah. He's a guy who, who likes to get off the spot, move his feet, and reset to his second and third read. You can't you could do that when you have David Bakhtiari and you have Zach Tom. Mm -hmm. You can't do that when now you're digging into possibly playing a rookie in Olu Fushano, who, who I like, but he's gonna be a rookie. Yeah. There's no way around it. So if Tyron Smith gets injured, if they start taking injuries at, at tackle, which they very melt very well might, then Man, you're you're talking about him running for his life once again, and if he's running for his life once again, then the Jets are back to being the Jets from 2023. <laughs> I love it because that's exactly where we're heading to. Um, let's shift back to the Dolphins. Um, I want to get your thoughts on Tyreek Hill because you got people out here who are dead set that this is Tyreek Hill's last season. You have Tyreek Hill out here mentioning in podcasts, hey, Greer, sign me, right? You had AB who did a podcast with um, with Tyreek Hill, and then a week later on his little CTESPN, on his little Jalen Waddle holdout tweet, the part that he did mention that caught my eye was, because he had just coming off an interview with Tyreek, was he said the Dolphins are looking to extend Tyreek Hill. Obviously, we know this is to work that 2025 number and spread out that money. Um, what are your thoughts on people out here saying this is going to be Tyreek Hill's last year? 
Um, where do you pitch a, see that? Because we talked about Jalen Waddle, you talked about the money, and we all believe are under the belief he's the heir apparent to the wide receiver one role. They've added OBJ. What what are your thoughts on Tyree Kill and how much longer he might be a Dolphin, given his contract, the off field stuff that you kind of picked up since last off season that the teams had to deal with. Um, what are your thoughts on that whole situation? Well, we can start with the player, right? Yeah. Is the is the player still good? He just had oh, two back to back career seasons, right? Yeah. Arguably best player in the NFL. Right. Uh, is he a good influence on the team and in on practice and in the locker room? One thousand percent. Okay. One million percent. In fact, I can't say it enough. If you go to practice and you're going to go there this year, you told me you're going to be yep. you're going to you know, come down this year. Yep. And you watch a practice that the Miami Dolphins conduct and Mike McDaniel conducts. First of all, they do everything 100 percent at full speed. They don't they don't they don't do any seven on sevens. You know, they don't do any skeleton drills. They go everything 11 on 11 full speed. Uh, they don't tackle to the ground, but they're going full speed. There's contact on the outside. Tyreek Hill is giving you 1,000% effort on every single rep, and he grabs reps when they're there with the second team, with the third team, okay? He is the model that you want, okay? He is the model citizen as far as a football player. That's what you want your highest paid player to be. Mm -hmm. Now, the off-field stuff is a problem, okay? It keeps showing up. It's something that you don't want to be dealing with because they have a tendency to escalate and you've seen some escalation and it's always something it's always one piece of drama or another but then when you get them inside the building and you're fine mm -hmm. i think we're at a situation where it's probably a 50 50 situation and they're gonna seek savings okay because they got people to pay they gotta pay yeah. holland they gotta pay jalen waddle they gotta pay jalen phillips it could be a situation where they're gonna seek savings there we already talked about bradley chubb being where they seek savings. We know they're going to seek savings off of Taron Armstead's departure. Mm -hmm. You know, is Tyreek Hill that guy? We know for a fact he's here for 2024. Yeah. I think 2025, I believe, is probably 50 50. And I know that's standing, that's sitting on the fence. But, you know, I think they're going to need some assurances. And, you know, if they pay Jalen Waddle, you know, his money's going to kick in in 2026. So if I had to bet, I would say that Tyreek Hill's last season is 2025 mm. because in 2026, it's a math game. You just yeah. can't do it. Yeah. You know? So I would venture to guess that they'll reduce his number for 2025 here this off season, use that money to be able to pay somebody else. But 2026, I'll put the odds at this. 2025 is 50-50. 2026 is 10%. Okay. Yeah, because it's kind of the same with Chubb, right? Like what you're saying. Like, yeah. if they, let's say they pay Phillips come 2026 when that money kicks in, are they going to pay Phillips 20 plus million and be paying Chubb 20 plus million? They're not going to be spending 50 ish million on two edge players. It's just not going to happen, right? Yeah, it's not going to happen. And they just can't do it. Yeah, you, know, you just can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's one of those things. So I, I put the odds there at that because there's always the possibility that he signs some type of team friendly deal, although I doubt it. So mm -hmm. let's go 50-50 on 2025, 10% on 2026 Ooh, I like for Tyreek. Speaking of contracts, I want to get your thoughts on the, I say pending, because it's it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, to a tongue of a loa. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts on what that pay range should be falling into, and also your thoughts on the process, because I was led to believe by from people I had at the Combine and coming out of the Combine, that this team really wanted that deal done when free agency opened up. And, you know, the, what I've been led to believe that athletes first kind of the one who threw a little wrench in it because they wanted to see what Dak's deal was going to be. And then we got word that Jerry Jones and them, they're not paying Dak this off season. So now all of a sudden you've seen ESPN since that came out, Oh, they're back to the table. They're back. Blah, 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 blah. What are your thoughts on this deal? How long it's taken? And what number would you be comfortable at? I'll be comfortable at, at a pretty wide range of numbers. If I'm representing Tua Tunga Valoa, I'm showing up with a piece of paper and I'm saying a dollar more than Justin Herbert got. 
Okay. And if they give me that, okay, we're signing. I think that the framework of the deal is going to be something similar to what Jalen Hurts got, which is a okay. pretty big number. Yeah. But it gives you some cap flexibility because essentially you could just revisit that contract over and over and over again every single year. Yeah. And just, you know, move money back and forth. And that'll help you with the salary cap and adding players. So I think that that's the framework as far as the total number, somewhere in that 52 to 53 range per year, mm-hmm. APY. Yeah. So it'll be hefty. It'll be a fat deal. You know, the same clowns on Twitter are going to cry, you know, but that's what they do. But, you know, like I've told them, you know, you know, either find another team or get used to it because it's, it's for the long haul. It's for like another 12 years here. He's going to be making that money. Yeah. So, you know, I'm comfortable with a lot. Can they get away with paying him less than market? I doubt it. Athletes first is not, that's not what they do. Yeah. You know, so I'm thinking something, you know, just get that Jalen Hurts deal and give it a 5% bump. And that's probably where we're going to end up with Tua Tonga What Like with this Tua deal, don't you like, aren't you like me? Don't you find comfort in the fact that they're projecting this cap to go up at least $30 million a year over the next three years. I mean, we're sitting at 255 in three years. We're going to be sitting at 350 potentially. And you know, he's not even going to be taken up. If you pay him 50 million, that won't even be 20% of the cap. If you get up to 350, right? So yeah. Yeah. And I try to explain to people, man, uh, for those of you that, that keep saying, Oh, have him play on the 50 year option and then, and then just franchise tag him. Okay, cool. So you have him play on the f- the fifth year option, then you franchise tag him. The franchise tag is going to be somewhere around thirty nine point five forty million dollars, somewhere around there. Do you have any idea with the pay raise on uh, with the raise on the cap where it's going to be if you start a contract in twenty twenty six? Because if you have him play on the fifth year option and then you franchise tag him for a year, you're talking about sixty five million APY. Yeah. So you want to pay fifty two million today, or you want to pay sixty five million in two years? Yep, that's like an entire new player that you could get for for sixty five million dollars. So it's you know fair warning. Just get this deal done. It's about the framework above all else. You know, I hope yeah. I hope the Dolphins don't get greedy with it because it doesn't really matter. Look at Jalen Hurts' deal. Jalen Hurts is much more susceptible to to injury because he runs the ball all the time. So look at that framework, and I think that that's what they're, where they're comfortable at, and I'm very, very comfortable with that. What's your finishing touch to this roster if you could add one uh, post-June 1st? Would it be Justin Simmons? And if it is Justin Simmons, how realistic do you think it is the Dolphins would be targeting a guy like that? Because I know fans really like him, really want him. But just where were you sitting? What would be your finishing touch if you were to add one? in this off season to this team? I think it'll be Con- Quandre Diggs because I okay. think that we have a lot of elements already on this team that can do what Justin Simmons can do. I also think that you'll get a savings off of Quandre Diggs. I think he'll be cheaper than mm-hmm. Justin Simmons. I think somebody's going to find themselves with a lot of cap space and then put a pretty fat number, maybe 8 million guaranteed for one year for Justin Simmons. Miami can't do that. Even though they're getting 18.5, remember, you got to allocate money for the draft. You want to sign an interior offensive lineman, and then you want to save somewhere around five or six million for incidentals during the season. You never know when you're going to need to spend some money in November. Yeah. So, you know, once you start putting all that money away, you're really talking about playing with about five to six million, maybe six million total tops. After you pay your your draft class and you set aside some money, I don't think that's enough to get Justin Simmons. But maybe you could get a Quandre Diggs in here for one year, three million dollars. Maybe that's something you can do. How much you do know? you think Justin Simmons is asking for? I would say I would say that number that I gave you. I think eight million dollars, most mm. of it guaranteed. Yeah, for one year. Uh, that's what that's what guys late have been getting as far as, you know, defensive backs. And I know cornerbacks a different position. I think uh, Stephon Gilmore got two years, 22 million, something like mm. that. His last deal, you know, he's not in the same spot. He's a little bit older than what Justin Simmons is right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Justin Simmons can, can command, I think $8 million, which would, which would, it's not going to put him anywhere near 
the top the five, top, but yeah. it puts him in the top ten for free safeties, which is probably where he's comfortable. Well, let me ask you this, because one thing I've said that makes sense if you're going to add a Justin Simmons, what if Javon Holland is playing hardball? And what if Javon Holland does want to come close to or reset that market? Getting Justin Holland, if Holland wants to do that, getting Justin Simmons in here gives you not only a one-year mercenary, but doesn't it give you kind of a security blanket um, of a guy who could be a, another year or two-year stopgap if you just can't get things figured out with Holland? Like, doesn't that give you a little bit of leverage? Yeah, I would agree. If you could bring somebody in like that. And I think you could do the same with Quandry Diggs. Quandry Diggs yeah. has a lot of position versatility as well, yeah. which is something that they're going to want. It's something mm-hmm. that Anthony Weaver is going to want, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I you want to bring in another another veteran safety. That's, that's just a fact. You need one. Are you not uh, interested in Jamal Adams at all? I, he, just doesn't, he doesn't have that position versatility. He can play... Yeah. Uh, Jamal Adams can play dime linebacker. He could play, he could play box three in their cover three. You already have Jordan Poyer to do both. Yeah, you know. Do you have big expectations for Jordan Poyer this year, or does it worry you that he may have lost a little bit of a step? Oh, he's definitely lost a step, but they're going to play him in that Buffalo role that they that they had him in last year. Uh, dime linebacker, you know, cover three box safety. Man, no doubt in my mind, he's going to pay dividends in that regard. You know, as a third safety, you can't ask for for much more. You know, if they play him some on the hash, I think he'll be he'll be able to do that because that's going to be a low stress job. You have you have Foley, you have Ramsey in front of you. Yeah. So so yeah. You know, I think he could do what he's going to be asked to do, and I don't think you know he's going to be a, a massive snap guy either. You know, mm. they're going to have some, like I said, some position versatility in that secondary especially if they add another safety, which I think they need to. Yeah. Um, OBJ, are, are, do, you, do you think it's not even a question the Miami Dolphins have the best wide receiver room in the league? And also, are you impressed with the fact that everyone calls him a cancer? Everyone labels him this, that, and the third. Yet this man has shown the humbleness to take a $3 million base with you know $5.5 million of incentives laid on top of that. And Alf, he's also accepted a three-time Pro Bowler who's who probably still believes he can play at number one level. He's taken the wide receiver wide receiver three spot with a smile on his face. Uh, what are your thoughts on 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 the lack of ego and his willingness to just buy in right off the rip like he has with the money he's taken and the role he's accepted? Yeah, I think a lot of that talk of him being some type of diva or a locker room cancer, that's just a bunch of nonsense, okay? Okay. That's people that are remembering his time in New York early on in his season when he did have some diva tendencies. He was also one of the best wide receivers in football and easily a top three or top four, top five talent Mm -hmm. in the game. So you could put up with some of that. But he's actually been shown to be a pretty good locker room leader. He's a smart guy. He does not drop footballs. Uh, one of my favorite stats, zero drops in his career in the end zone. Tyreek Hill has two from last season. And does okay. he only have one playoff playoff drop ever? Like he has one? one playoff drop ever. He has one drop in the red zone for his career. That's crazy. <laughs> okay. So that means when they cross the 20-yard line, he doesn't drop a ball. Well, Ever. that means we also got someone we can finally throw the fade to that McDaniel loves so much. How about we just get rid of that from the playbook? <laughs> I agree, right. bro. I <laughs> okay. agree. All right. Now, if you want to get it out of your system, you want to throw him a fade, let's do it in you know preseason game number two. All right. How's that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, I look, I and and <laughs> my partner's done a great job on this, Chris Kaufman. He put up some numbers on Twitter. Um, people just have it dancing around in their heads that. Tyreek Hill and Jalen Water are on the field for every single snap of every game. They're not. They're together about 40% of the time. Yeah. Okay? So there's a lot of snaps to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, now you have Odell Beckham taking a lot of those snaps. Now you have Jalen Water and Odell Beckham out there in 21 personnel when Tyreek takes a breather. You have Tyreek and Odell Beckham out there when Waddle takes a breather in 21 personnel or 12 personnel. So now you have a lot more versatility. Your 11 personnel grouping should be absolutely lethal. Yeah, okay? I agree. Yeah. And when, when, when Beckham takes to the outside, that's a lot. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, I want Tyler Boyd. And, and it, this is what I told everybody. Tyler Boyd's a better player. 
but Odell Beckham is a much better fit. Yeah. Odell Beckham's going to occupy guys over the top on the outside. He's going to let Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle operate in the slot. Mm-hmm. You know, Tyler Boyd is a slot exclusive player. Yeah. Odell Beckham played only 12% of his snaps last year in the slot. Mm-hmm. While Tyler Boyd played 76% of his sl- of his snaps in the slot. So this is going to help that offense immensely. And we still haven't even gotten to John o. Smith, who's going to pay a lot of dividends and all kinds of personnel groupings. So, no, I absolutely love the signing. Uh, I think it's going to pay big, big dividends. Well, that was the next thing I was going to get into because, you know, I had my podcast this year every four weeks. It was called the Cover 4 Pod with me and Omar Kelly. And I was t- kept stressing them, this team needs a tight end, right? Look at McVay, Higby, right? You look at um, Shanahan, Kittle, right? You look at every off. We can go down the list, right? You know, LaFleur drafted two guys last year in uh, Tucker Craft and um, who was the uh, Luke Musgrave, right? Mm-hmm. You look at when you look at the offshoots of, of, of the Shanahan offense, they all have their tight end except us. We had Durham Smythe, right? Who, I mean, you know, he can catch the football, but you're not exactly threatening the seams with him, right? Yeah, he's slow. And, he's slow. And, yeah. and this is a, this is important because I've talked about this all the time. Hate to interrupt you, Reason. No, go ahead. But uh, it, this is really important, and it's important that, that your listeners and your viewers know this. It's important to time up with your wide receivers. Now, I understand, you know, it's very hard to find a tight end that's going to be as fast as Tyreek Hill, but, but they just got to be reasonably close. Mm-hmm. To Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. John o. Smith is that. John yeah. o. Smith is a four six guy. He could do yeah. that. Durham Smythe just can't. He can't time up with your guys on the outside. It ruins the timing of your pass routes. So that's why tight end was so important. And John o. Smith is a great signing. Uh, how, like, how impressed are you? Are you with the addition of John o. Smith? I mean, talk about you know we always talk about how okay Gasicki at the catch point yeah he's okay. But this guy's great at the catch point, but what he out offers you after the catch, like you said earlier, it's something we haven't had in that room for quite some time. Yeah, you want you want to laugh a little bit? Uh, Go ahead. John o. Smith in a game against the Vikings last year broke more tackles in the first half than Mike Gusecki broke here in his last three years. <laughs> I'm not surprised, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. John o. Smith breaks tackles. He, you could run some design passes with him too. You could run tunnel screams with him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you could split him out wide. He could play Y ISO. Okay. He could play some in line. He's a willing blocker, and that's more than enough, man. Okay. While Mike Gasecki was not a willing blocker, John o. Smith is, which means he'll get in, he'll get in the way of somebody. And sometimes that's enough yep. for this system. So, yeah, I lo- absolutely love the signing. He should pay big, big dividends. And hey, I know you mentioned him earlier, but uh, listen, the last time John Embry had a tight end like this was Jordan Cameron in Cleveland. Now we got the concussed version of Jordan Cameron in Miami, but he was a baller in Cleveland, man. So, yes. I, I, you know, I can't wait to see what John who does in this. I mean, you look at this web, the weapons, my friend, and uh, all you got to do is give two a time, and he's gonna is five thousand a real. Now I know we all we all are the same. We want the playoff win, screw the numbers. But the people who try to say, "Oh, these numbers are hollow," are absolute lunatics. Because Tua Tungaloa, first quarterback wearing aqua and orange to make the Pro Bowl since '95. Alf, you watch it, right? Last couple of years, how many mm-hmm. season or single game franchise records of Marino have we saw fall at their wayside to Tua Tungaloa? Is five thousand when we talk about these weapons with A Chan catching the ball in the backfield, Mozart, I think Wright can catch the ball really well in the backfield too. You look at the John Smith, the receiving core, Malik Washington added to that core. Do you think this is a legitimate shot at five thousand yards? Because with OBJ, you mentioned something about you know being on the on the field and how the position groupings are going to work. Another thing that I keep stressing to people, what I stressed over the need for a tight end was Tua threw the ball 560 times last year. Only 275 of those targets were occupied by Waddle and Tyreek, meaning there's almost, you know, another 285 to go around. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on this offense and Tua potentially getting close to 5,000 this year? Uh, I think there's a it's a possibility, but they, I think they want a little bit more balance. And I think the there's two numbers I look at, okay, okay. which I think are important. 
<laughs> and I stress these every single year. Okay, three touchdowns. That's that's the first number. You want to average at least three touchdowns. That's a competent offense in the NFL. They averaged 3.5 last year. Okay. I think they're going to be able to do that. 2,500 is another number I care about. 2,500 rushing yards. I think they're going to be able to do that. They came, they came reasonably close last year. I don't even have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure they were somewhere around 22, 23 last year. So if they could get to 25, that's a, a pretty sizable improvement. And the the last number that that I come to that I think is absolutely realistic and that's the one I think it can and actually will happen and that's 40 touchdowns I think Tua can throw for 40 touchdowns mm. and the reason I think that ha- that will likely happen is because it probably would have happened last year there was a lot of vultured touchdowns there by the running yeah, backs Raheem yeah about yes, Raheem from Raheem yeah. OK, yeah. that could have easily been some some waggle plays, some some slip screens that would have been touchdown passes for Tua Tonga Valoa. He did have four drops for touchdowns. Yeah, that would have put him up at 33 already. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about 5000. I think there's an outside shot because I don't think they want to throw it for 5000 yards. Yeah. But 40 touchdown passes. Absolutely. In the cards. Do you think another impact is what you talked about with OBJ and maybe Jonu Smith? Do you think we're going to be more successful throwing the football in the red zone? Absolutely, because the the you know the target package now is going to be completely different. It's going to be much more diverse. Mm-hmm. You know, teams are just not going to be able to ignore your tight end in line or your tight end in Y ISO. There's a play that happened in that playoff game, which was really really instructive okay the jerry sneed had tyreek out on the boundary they run him in motion they cause a call of the numbers and you know what that is uh, you know it's yeah. just the the outside guy tells the inside guy you got two which means you're taking the guy who's releasing inside i got one i got the guy who's releasing outside so in this case they do their switch and i believe it was justin reed who was inside so now justin reed has tyreek hill on the seam and the Jerry Sneed has Durham Smythe outside and you see it at the snap Tua sees it and Tua is like, okay, I got action here and I probably got action to Tyreek because the Jerry Sneed is occupied with Durham Smythe on the outside at the snap. You can see Sneed is playing both guys at the same time. He's playing Durham Smythe with one eye while he plays Tyreek Hill hard on his back pedal and when he throws the ball he leaves durham smythe wide open he was essentially just paying attention to durham smythe like okay i'm not gonna leave you wide open but i don't care that you're out here yeah because i know i can make up space on you mm-hmm. but tyreek i'm gonna keep an eye on him and it ended up becoming double coverage and that was a double covered and that was the the ball that got tipped down at the in the end zone i believe it was in the second quarter so you know, that's an issue, and that's not going to be able to happen this year. Teams are not going to be able to sag off of John O. Smith. Mm, yeah. They're not going to be able to sag off of Odell Beckham. You're going to have to keep your, your coverage integrity. And when you keep your coverage integrity, you stay by your rules. And if you stay by your rules, Tyreek Hill will burn you. He will mm. break those rules, especially releasing from the inside on the slot. He's going to mm. stress safeties. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. And, and now, too, has, has guys that if he has to come off of that, and they do have it covered well. He could come off to Odell Beckham. He could come off to John o. Smith. And he's going to have action there. Yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely love everything that they've done. Awesome, man. Man, I appreciate you coming on. Um, listen, and go ahead. Plug anything you got coming up where people can find you and where they can follow you at and where they can listen to your takes. Go ahead. Plug it. The floor is yours, my friend. All right, man. If you want to listen to my podcast, it's where you always, wherever you get your podcast. It's the number three yards per carry. If you want to become a member of our Discord, it's only three dollars a month. We have over two thousand like-minded Dolphin fans, another two hundred invetted that pay twenty-five dollars a month. But if you want to become an entry-level member, it's only three dollars a month. You go to discord.gg forward slash onlyfans right there. You see the logo right there, <laughs> and you can become a member there for three dollars a month appreciate you coming on alf and uh look forward to doing it again man thanks again for coming on bro it was a great conversation so thank you thank you for having me 
Um, guys, just smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. And as always, I'll see you on the next one. Until then, fins up, go fins, whatever floats your boat after that season desist came. Appreciate you all, and thank you all for tuning in.